Sorry, took Lee away. <laughs> <laughs> My grandfather, Bill Rice, spent several weeks in the Belgian Congo giving the gospel to people, many of whom had never heard the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. When he came back to the States, he found that there was an entire group in America, much like the people he had been listening to in the Belgian Congo in Africa. Those were people who, like his own daughter, were deaf and therefore had never heard the gospel. In 1953, Bill and Kathy Rice began Bill Rice Ranch in order to give the gospel to those who had not heard it. At the ranch, deaf and people swim, ride horses, play games, meet friends from literally across the country, and most importantly, they hear the gospel in their own language from people who know them, understand them, and love them. Jesus is not dead. Jesus now is alive. Hello, my name is Tyler Thornton. Hello, I am Rebecca. At the age of 12, I came here to the Bill Rice Ranch and became saved. Later, we met while working here with the deaf children. I'm excited to be back here working with deaf children, helping them to understand about Jesus Christ. Now, I am the director of Deaf Camp, continuing to reach deaf children for Christ. For more than 65 years, deaf young people have come to the Bill Rice Ranch free of charge. They do not pay a thing. And for more than 65 years, God has provided for us as we provide camp for them. Would you prayerfully consider giving to make a week of camp possible for a deaf young person this summer?
stand together for our final hymn this morning. We're going to sing hymn number 244. This is a song that many of us learned just last week. It's a great invitation hymn, Let Jesus Come Into Your Heart. We're going to sing verses 1, 3, and 4. And then on, but after, the first, after verses 1 and 3, we're going to dismiss the children out into the back for the, chil for the children's church hour. Brother Will, you please come. All right, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good see you. It's been a little while since we've been privileged to be here, and we love Pastor and Mrs. Price. We love this church, and if I haven't met you, I'm, I'm glad that we'll have a chance today. And if you're a guest, if you're like I am, you're a guest, um, they're even nice to people from Tennessee here, so I'm sure they'll be nice to you too. And if you're like us, we're just so thankful that you've come and joined us today, and glad to be able to present the ministry of Bill Rice Ranch specifically to deaf young people and let you catch just a glimpse of that. There are three generations, Pastor said this is Sunday school, three generations of us here today. Uh, my dad and mom, Dr. Bill Rice III, Mary, and they're right here, uh, not blocking the camera, but really close. And then my wife, Sina, is the one that just sang, Mom, uh, signed in sign language, American Sign Language, Sina sang in English, and so that's my wife, Sina, and then Weston is the youngest of our three children. We have a daughter in college, she's 21. We have a boy that's at Bill Rice Bible Institute, he's 18. Uh, Weston is 15 and I'm <clears throat> still young, kind of. <laughs> All right, so glad to be with you this morning, glad we could share this with you. Father, thank you for the Bible, thank you for this church, and thank you for the privilege of being here. We're so grateful that we can be. And I pray that what we see and what I say will honor you and encourage us. I pray for those that never trusted the Lord Jesus they would see the righteousness of God and the conscience that he's put in each one of us and the love that compelled him to send the Lord Jesus. And uh, I pray that you'd help us to think not just about what we're doing today, but the reasons for which we do them. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Romans 13, we were in Romans 12 today, this morning uh, in Sunday school with my dad. So we're just like the next page. Let me ask you a question. Let me begin with, with young people. If, if, your teacher walks out of the classroom tomorrow. She says, everyone be quiet. What's the first thing that happens as soon as the teacher's out of the classroom? Uh, what do you do when the teacher leaves the classroom? And why would you ever do the right thing? Do you do the right thing and why would you? Uh, different context, but if you're uh, uh, an adult, if pastor were in Kansas next, why would you go to Kansas in, in February? I don't know, but if he goes back to Kansas um, for a, a week, and he's not here next Sunday, are you going to be here? If you knew a pastor was not going to be here next Sunday, would you be here? In short, do you make your practice of doing the right thing? And more specifically, even if you do the right thing, why do you do it? And does it matter? Now, I think we can kind of go to seed on, you know, judging our motives and so on, but I think it is a worthwhile endeavor to just see what the Bible says about not just doing the right thing, but the reasons for which we do that. Romans 13 deals with the government and the law. Uh, as to the government, I'm just talking about human government. Uh, as to law, I'm talking about the Ten Commandments in particular. And so God is the one, God is the one who invented pastors, parents, and presidents. I don't mean our form of government per se, but God is the one 
who invented the home and the, the government and also the church. And so we find here in that setting three motives, motivations, that can govern us. And I want to ask you which one is governing you, if any of them at all, all at all, right? Uh, why would any of us do the right thing? We'll begin in verse 1, all right? And see if you can see if you can see the motivation dealt with in the first few verses here, specifically in light of uh, living in submission, in light of the authorities that God has placed in our in our government in particular. Verse 1, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. He's talking very specifically about government. Not every government is godly, most of them are not. But the concept of being governed, the concept of authority, even in government, is God's idea. And you, you find out why that's important. For there is no power but of God, the powers, the authorities, that be are ordained of God. So no one has authority except at the, the uh, pleasure of God Almighty. Now, I'm not preaching on that today. There's much that can be said. But I want to I show you something kind of hidden away in the text. Not, not hidden, but, but uh, subservient in the text. Verse 2. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation or destruction. Is the idea. It's not talking about hell. It's talking about destruction. So God, God is saying, look, government is God's idea, just like church is God's idea, and the home is God's idea. And when we buck against the authorities that we find in these institutions, we war against the universe because we war against God. Now, that's strongly stated, but that is... What it's saying, verse 3, for rulers, now this is ideal, okay, this is the purpose for government, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Would you like to live your life without fearing every time you see a police car? Here's what you do. Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he that is government is the minister, the servant of God, to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. Why? For he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger, to execute wrath upon him that doth evil. Okay, so let me just look, just look up this way. What is the motivation you find tucked away? Not even tucked away, it's obvious, it's repeated. What is the motivation for doing the right thing in, in the context of government? We're going to broaden it to just life in general. What is the motivation that we find in these first few verses? that would compel someone to do the right thing? Fear. Fear. Very good. Now, wh why do you say fear? Be because it's what it says. Yeah, exactly. You're finding it from the Bible. I love this. So we're, we're not just making this up. <laughs> Notice words like, be afraid. Uh, Notice words like, praise, which is the same thing, just the flip side of the same coin. You're fearful or you're praised for doing the right thing. A, a person that's motivated by fear is also easily motivated by praise and vice versa. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, notice he says... Uh, uh, wrath. Um, notice he talks about uh, a revenger of God. So, you know what? You may not like this, and this may not be the highest form of motivation, but it's one that's validated by God. In fact, it's one that, that is acknowledged, and I think even um, blessed by God. That is this idea of fear. So, uh, fear is definitely a motivation. Uh, two years ago, almost exactly, my 350 Dually was stolen in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I actually watched the truck drive off the lot at 5.45 in the morning and uh, wave goodbye. Now, I, I, I can tell a little story, but I'm not going to for, for the sake of time. But, two days later we got our truck back. When I called 911, when I called the police after the truck was stolen, it took them two hours to respond. Two hours! <laughs> now, when they arrived, they were polite, they were professional, they were competent, but two hours, why? Well, I found out why two days later when we got our truck back, and I spent $100 to get it cleaned out, long story, it was just, it was roughed up royally. And, and uh, so I just, we, we, we wanted it deep clean because I needed it. And so I'm sitting on a bench outside the car wash in Albuquerque, New Mexico, facing Loma Avenue. And all of a sudden, meow, 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 Four black SUVs, lights blazing, are off to some kind of emergency. They were not uniformed, but they were all going at the same time, so something big was going down, I, I thought. A, a couple minutes later, a police box truck. Didn't know they had them, but they do. In Albuquerque, anyway. They need them. 
A couple minutes later, uh, a police marked skid steer, like a small bulldozer, and then another box truck, and then an armored truck. I don't mean a Humvee with some plates. I mean, think a tank without a turret. I mean a full-blown armored truck. And I'm thinking, what in the world? I hope it didn't take two hours for them to respond, you know? So, an hour later, we get our clean truck, we're driving down to the rental place to turn in the car we'd use for the, you know, the intervening two days, and two more police cars passed us, and when we got to the car rental, it was just a half uh, road over from where the, all this police presence was. Loma Avenue drains into downtown Albuquerque, it drains left, as roads draining left into downtown Albuquerque, and there were 30 response vehicles parked on the main drag downtown Albuquerque. There was a chopper in the air, and my family, when I was getting my rental car turned back in, could hear, you know, you've always heard about this, they, they heard police saying, come out with your hands up. Now the next day I wanted to Google Albuquerque standoff. And I, look, I'm all for Albuquerque, I love New Mexico, so I'm not trying to beat up Albuquerque. Just don't take a nice truck if you go. Um, I googled Albuquerque standoff and you know what I got? Nothing. <laughs> I didn't know which one was mine. Okay, now here's the bottom line. Why did it take them two hours to get to my truck? A lot of crime. It's small fry. I mean, who cares about some poor hick from Tennessee that lost his truck when you've got a standoff in downtown Albuquerque. Now this sounds really poor in Albuquerque, but it's their fault, okay? Here's the bottom line. Um, if people do right only when they're afraid of being caught, how often will they do the right thing? Is that the kind of world in which you want to live? Everyone is right by other people, as long as you have a big baseball bat held over their head. Now, nobody wants to live that way, but all of us live that way sometimes. So for instance, I'm not trying to say, if you don't come to church here next Sunday, you are godless. But you know what? I will tell you, it's the right thing to do. It's helpful. But if pastor were not going to be here next Sunday, suppose he's preaching in Kansas. If I did show up, what it indicates is the only time I do the right thing is when I fear being, you know, embarrassed. Pastor would punish you, but, you know, um, it's only when you feel being embarrassed. It's, it's a little bit like people that always seek to be praised. Uh, Ron Riley's a, a friend. He's not a peer, but he's a friend. He's an evangelist. And I've heard him tell this story many times. And he uses such self-deprecating humor, you know, to be modest, that I've kind of missed a, a truth, which is there was a time when he did a very brave thing. Long story short, he happens into a 7-Eleven store just as a robber is going down. He grabs a two-liter of coke, whacks the guy, and holds him till the police get there. <laughs> Okay, so they had a big Ron Riley day. They, you know, the mayor gave him the keys to the town. They took pictures. They did nice things. And he makes a joke out of it. But I start thinking about it. that's not a joke. That, I would be bragging about that if I'd done that. I would not make a joke of it. I'd say, no, yeah, it was nothing. I just clobbered the guy and held him till the SWAT got there. I would do something like that. Okay. Now praise is not a bad motive. I think uh, pastors encouraged us this morning. Just it's just what pastors do. But I'll tell you something. If you are solely motivated by uh, praise, what are you going to do when it becomes unpraiseworthy to do the right thing? Let me ask you a question. Does the government ever praise evil? Yes. yes. It does. And we're not going to get that right now. Yes, it does. And does the, is, does, is society clamping down as immoral? By the way, an allegation might be people who are amoral. They, they claim to be immoral people who actually hold to the Word of God and, and what the Bible teaches and go for broke on that. Okay. So what I'm saying is um, fear is a valid motivation. It does have its limitations. All right. Fear, fear. Now here's a question before we go to the next thing. Do you have a healthy reverence for God and the authorities He's placed in your life? You know, a person who has no fear whatsoever requires a SWAT team to help him do a trial. That person is not just a minister to society. He's not to help other people. So you may not be a guy that's standing off the SWAT team, but if the only time you do the right thing is when you fear. Or, or, or when you're praised, that's a problem. Having said that, you know, we all need a healthy reverence for God and the authorities He's placed in our life. Do you have that kind of reverence, that kind of respect? Second, second uh, motivation is found in verse 5, where the Bible says, Wherefore ye must needs be subject, you must you need to be obedient, not only for wrath, but also for conscience' sake. So, what's the second motivation? 
Go ahead. The swink knows, but he's already he's already given me one answer. So what what what's the second motivation? Guilt. Okay, guilt. Okay, and specific. What's the word in the text? We just read. It. Yeah, you're right to some extent. Not only for wrath, that is fear you're going to be roughed up, but also for conscience sake. Okay, so what he's talking about is fear. That's a motivation. Second motivation is conscience. Now, uh, is fear uh, external or internal? <laughs> It's, yeah, I guess it's both. I had external, but yeah, it's both. But what? when I fear, I'm not fearing something inside, am I? I'm fearing something outside. If you don't do right, I'm going to write your head. If you do right, I'll give you a Snickers bar. Okay, you don't want a society where everyone does the right thing because they're either going to get whacked or fed, right? Second motivation is inside. It's called conscience. It's something God gave you, and it can't be misled. <clears throat> um, what does conscience mean? Science. What does science mean? S-C-I-E-N-C-E. -E. What is that prep? That... Uh, Prefix, it's not a prefix. Knowledge. Knowledge, right? So the science is, the, is, is knowledge, right? It's, it's what we know. Conscience is with knowledge. Okay, prescience. We don't use that very often. It's knowing something ahead of time. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. So conscience, the very constant, by the way, in, in the original language as well as our English word, uh, it means what we know. Uh, it means doing what we do with thinking. It, here's what it means. It means we must be honest about what it is we know. You ever, you ever been caught in doing something you should not have done or not doing something you should do and you said, oh, I, I forgot. If you don't remember, you can't do right. If you don't know right, you can't do right. Um, my, my, I'll blame my little sister because she's not here. I did the same thing. But my sister, Ren, when Ren was like a four-year-old girl, she had this she had this shtick whenever she got in trouble with that. She would say, and it was very cute, so it worked even better. I think it didn't work with that really, but it, I thought it was effective. Uh, she'd say, yes, Daddy, but I, I did it on an accident. It was never on accident. She always put in the article, it was on an accident. Like, I'm not guilty, I didn't do this. I, it was on an accident. Okay, so what was she doing? She was saying, I, it's not my fault, it was accidental. I can't just tell you something. I, I tell young people this all the time. You cannot obey if you will not listen. I didn't hear you. It was on an accident. I forgot. If you won't remember, you can't obey. I forgot. I didn't know it was on an accident. Look, here's the point. A lot of times um, we will say, well, what's wrong with this? Now, that may be a fair question, but you know it's amazing the conclusions you come to if you just change this, the question a half notch. Here's a better question for you. I'm not trying to make you uh, psychotic, but what would be right with this? All of a sudden, your whole take on everything is different. Instead of saying, what's wrong with it? I don't see what's wrong with it. Okay. <clears throat> that may be, that's not a good attitude, but it may be a fair question. But a better question is, what is right about this? Do you, do you think there would be a difference in this church, in your home, and in society, if people, b between people saying, well, what's wrong with that? And, hey, what would be helpful about this? What would be right about this? Do you think there would be a difference in conclusions based on separate questions? Well, I do too. So, let me say this. We're not talking about worry. Some people are inclined to be introspective and hand-wringers and worriers. And, oh, I stepped on an ant. I hope it's okay. I hope, you know. They're, they're not, they don't have a conscience. They have a worry. They're not, they're not conscience-filled. They're worry-filled. Do you understand the difference? Some people, they have an uninformed conscience. And so they worry excessively. I'm not talking about excessive worry. I'm talking about thoughtfulness. Full of thought. Thinking about it. That means you and I are obliged to have an informed conscience. To know what God's opinion is about things. Not to worry about things, but to know what God's opinion is. That's confidence. Okay? Uh, with, you know, we confide in people. You can confide in God. And, and confidence, the, 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 that feeling of confidence comes from knowing that that um, God knows us and knowing what God has said, knowing God's, and it rules out excuses. So sometimes a kid will say about his mom, well, she didn't say we couldn't. Hey, mom, have you told your children not to do everything that it would be possible for them to do that's wrong? In other words, do you have a rule for everything that, that could possibly go wrong in your house? The answer is no. So sometimes kids will say, well, there's not a rule about it. You know, there's not a rule against setting your hair on fire in my house but I would object to my kids doing it. Right? That's common sense. That's something with knowledge. So we're not just talking about, is it against the rules? We're asking, 
uh, is this something that is right? Now, how, how might you inform your conscience? How would your conscience get better? How would you know more accurately what's right, what's wrong, and how to do it? How would you know that? Just take a guess. How, how would you know the right thing to do? I'm sorry? God's Word. Yes. I mean, that, that is true. See, if God has an opinion on something, He has revealed that. Everything about which God has a, an opinion, God has given us guidance. There are a lot of things that, that we don't know. Everything we need to know, we do know. So, God's Word. How, how would I know what God's Word says then? Read it. Read it? That'd be one way. What's another way? Hear it. Hiding your heart? Is that what you said? Yeah. Okay, yeah. In other words, not just memorizing, and I'm, I'm, I'm jumping off this, but not just memorizing, thinking about it. What does it say? What does it mean? What should I do? I mean, common savvy for every day. Uh, what else? Asking. Asking. Asking the Word of God? Asking God to find the answer. Okay, I like this. In other words, having a curiosity to say, okay, what does the Bible say about this? Instead of just saying, well, God doesn't say anything about that. Does the Bible say anything about speeding on I-75? There's no I-75. There were no cars. There was no... Sp How would you speed in those days? <laughs> Slow that camel down. I don't know. You, what, you're going to fall off. I, okay, but are there principles in the Bible that could be applied to speeding on I-75? Yes. I hope not. Uh, yeah, they're probably... That was a joke. Um, <laughs> Romans 13. Romans, yeah, we're in. We're actually in it right now, right? Obey every ordinance of man. First Peter says, "For the Lord's sake, every ordinance of man." I hate that, but it's there. Of man, not God. Of man, why? Not for His sake. I didn't vote for Him, but He's the authority. For the Lord's sake. You understand? Amen. Okay. So uh, you've got fear. You've got you've got uh, conscience. One more motivation. We're done. You ready? The Bible says in verse eight. Oh, no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. That is, you're not going to break a law, God's law or man's law, if you if you love people. I mean, you know, we talk about hate crimes. No crime is driven by love. <laughs> Sincerely. I'm not I just mean you don't do the wrong thing because you love somebody. That's not that's not fair nor right, nor logical. For this, verse 9, thou shalt not commit adultery. Some says, but we were so in love. It's not love. See, if it's wrong, it's not love. If it's love, it's not wrong. Do you understand? There may be affection, but that's not, that's not doing right by my neighbor. It's not doing right by God. Now, there's a lot to be entangled there. We're not going to entangle this morning, but I'm just telling you what the Bible actually says. Okay? Uh, thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt... Well, I, I was lying to protect them. That's not love. See, that's why, that's why we can get confused because we go with things that seem simple to us and sometimes the easier a decision is to make, the harder it is to live with. If we take the time to see what God says, those things are a lot easier to live with down the road. Uh, thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandment, it, I love this, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Lo love is doing right. I love this. All the laws you can have of mankind, they're briefly comprehended. Isn't that beautiful? Not complex. Not some long legal code. There's a need for that, unfortunately. But he's saying they're briefly comprehended. You don't have to be a rocket scientist. So, look, what we're talking about is the goodwill to do the right thing in good faith. The goodwill to do the right thing in good faith. You know why, you know why God is not sending me to hell? It's not because I love Him. It's because He loves me. God is a just God. We ought to fear Him and the authorities He's put in our life. But God is a loving God, and God mm -hmm. hates sin. But mm -hmm. God loves sinners like me so much that 2,000 years ago, He sent His Son mm -hmm. to live the perfect life I could never live. He never broke the Ten Commandments. I have. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Is there anyone here honest enough to, uh, to admit that you're not honest enough? Thou shalt not commit adultery. Jesus said you can do that in your heart. Okay, so he kept the law. I have not. You and I deserve to be punished because God God would not be God were he, were he to wink at us and he'd no longer be God. Do you want heaven to be like Fort Lauderdale or Nashville? I love Fort Lauderdale. It's beautiful. But I don't want heaven to be stuck with all the flaws that we have down here. Nor Nashville, which is my home. 
Do you understand? I'm not knocking Nashville Nash or Fort Lauderdale. I don't love them both. I'm saying heaven's a lot different than this. It's much better. Even better than the weather, if you can imagine that. So Jesus took our place. He took our punishment. He took our, our hell. And so the Bible says, For God so loved the world, that means even sinners, that He gave, He didn't demand, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever, that means you, I don't care where you're from, what you've done, who you are, whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So let me tell you something, that's on your head. God has done everything it takes to save your soul. But He's not going to force it on you or force it on you, it's on your head. Will you come to Christ and, and take it by faith, the gift of salvation, or will you go your own way? Now look, love works no ill. <coughs> we're not talking about a feeling, we're talking about action. Um, so, uh, love is the fulfilling of the law. Uh, you know, in Galatians 5, the Bible says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness. And then it says, against which there is no law. There's no law against doing the right thing. Not in God's heaven, anyway. So love is doing what's right by people. Now look, fear sometimes, the question is, well, will I be caught? Bad question. A conscience even is limited. Sometimes the, the question of conscience is, well, do I agree? So-and-so says this, but do I agree? Love doesn't do either one of those things. Love says, uh, do I love this person? Um, is this what I would want them to do to me? So you've got fear, you've got conscience, and you've got love. And it's briefly comprehended real quickly here. A guy named Joseph Parker, he was a pastor in London a long time ago. He said, rules cannot be made for hypocrites. The gracious provision can be made only for, for sincere men, sincere people. Here's another one. D hat. Not a, not a, this is business, but it's interesting. Simple, clear purpose and principles give rise to complex and intelligent behavior. Now what this means is, when people know, um, uh, when, when people are motivated by um, a clear purpose, this is what this church is about. This is what the school is about. This is what the society is about. It, it results in complex and intelligent behavior because if you know the goal, then you can figure out how to get there sometimes. On the other hand, Complex rules and regulations give rise to simple and, forgive me, stupid behavior. Now, let me, let me put it to you this way. If I'm in a school and there are 50 rules, and I'm, I'm not against rules, but if I've got 50 rules, what it's easy to do is assume if there are this many rules, then they've talked about everything they could possibly talk about, and there's not a rule about this, so I'm going to do it. Whereas if I knew the rule is, hey, we do right by each other, and I, you need to have rules specific. I don't, don't go excessive on me here. But if I know, hey, we do right, we love each other here, then you know what? I'm going to be able to figure out on my own if I have a lick of sense, by God's grace, the right thing to do. Now, here's the bottom line. We're done. The more love you have, the less governing you'll need. And part of the problem in our homes, in our church, in our nation right now, is we have the governing, we don't have the love. And you can't long govern people like that. Not without a tyranny. Yeah. And I'm big on that. Are you? So the, the more love you have, this is God-inspired and God-enabled and God-animated, the less governing you need. Love for God and love for people. Here are, my, here are my three questions in closing. Are you doing the right thing today? Are you doing the right thing? Number one, are you doing right relative to uh, a healthy fear of God and the authority He's placed in your life? Are you that guy who is always dismissive of authority unless it's you? I'll just tell you this. Mark the man who's always talking about authority, but only in the context of, I'm the boss. I'm the man of God. I'm the government of God. I'm the whatever. We ought to give such people authority. But you, you mark an authority that's always talking about authority, but only his own, that is a danger. Beware that man. Because we're in a chain of command. The more authority you're under, the more authority you have. And so, do you, do you have a healthy fear of God and the authorities he's placed in your life? You may be 75 years old, and a man of great influence. But let me tell you something. All of us have someone we can listen to and someone we ought to obey. So, do you have a healthy fear? Number two, are you informing and developing your conscience? Are you merely worrying? Are you ignoring? Or are you saying, hey, what does the Bible say? Let me ask the Bible. Does God actually talk about this? What does he say? What should I do? Now, that's frightening because that obliges us. But, you, you know, God would have you do things that you can't do. But if you'll know what he said and obey him, he'll do it through you. And I'm not being... 
super pious here. That's true. And if you haven't experienced it, then you need to get going. Number three, are you acting in love? Are you doing what you're doing because of a God-inspired love and demonstrating to people who have never seen Jesus the love Jesus had when he came to take your place on the cross? So are you doing the right thing this morning? And if so, why? <clears throat> Would you bow with me, please, for prayer? You've been very kind. Thank you for your time and attention. Pastor may join me. No one else is looking. Can I just ask a couple questions this morning? Number one, I wonder how many people here would say, you know, Will, I am not perfect, and no one's looking. I'm not here to embarrass you. I'm not perfect, but thank God I have trusted the Lord Jesus to forgive my sin. I'm saved, and I know it. If that's your testimony, can I just invite you to raise your hand as an indication that I'm saved, I've trusted the Lord Jesus to save me, and I know it. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. You can put your hands down. Many hands. And if you don't know that you're saved, I'm so glad you're here. The people in this church love you because God does. And He demonstrated that by sending Jesus to die in your place. Second question. Of those of you who just raised a hand, I wonder how many would say, you know, Brother Will, I either need to cultivate a healthy respect for authority, I need to inform and develop my conscience, or I need to start acting in the love of Jesus. And, and God has spoken in my heart about one of those three areas. Doing the right in light of uh, a, a healthy fear of a developed and informed conscience or acting love. That doesn't describe my life, but it should go oh, by God's grace. Pray for me. Would you raise your hand? God bless you. God bless you and you and you and you. Thank you so much. You can, you can put your hands down. Third question. I wonder how many here would just say, Will, now don't embarrass me, but I, I don't know that I'm, my sins are forgiven and I don't know that I'm on my way to heaven. I do not know that I have ever trusted Jesus Christ alone to forgive me and save me. But if I could be saved by trusting the Lord Jesus, I'd like to I'd like to be. Pray for me. Don't embarrass me, but do pray for me. I've never trusted Jesus to save me, but I'm interested in that. Please pray for me. Is there one like that this morning? You just say, I've never, I've never come clean with God by trusting His Son as my Savior, but I need to pray for me. Is there, is there one like that this morning? All right, would you look would you look this way? You can look right right up here. In just a moment, I'll I'll pray and just ask the Lord to help me. Look, this this has been fairly general. So if, if this morning God spoke in your heart about, you know, I've just not been I've been dismissive of authorities in, in my life. Okay, that's that's a big deal. It may not seem like it may not have even been visible before this morning, but that's why we're here this morning. God knew that, and God's given us his word. If you're here this morning and you'd say, you know, the fact of the matter is, either I am ignoring what I know to be right or I'm worrying about what is right. I've not been developing my conscience. Then that's not just a good decision. It's one that demands an action, right? What does that mean? It means I need to be here where I can learn the Word of God. It means I need to be uh, learning how to read the Bible. Maybe you don't know how to read. I don't mean you don't know how to read, but how do I understand the Bible? That's why you have a pastor to help equip you. So find out. Ask questions. Be curious. Amen. Please. Uh, maybe you're here today and you just say, you know, Maybe I'm even doing the right thing, but I know I've not been motivated by love. Okay, well, you know what? If I'm like Jesus, then that, that describes my life. Loving of people, hateful of sin, and, and uh, motivated by the love of Christ. So if God spoke from your heart about that, then just do business with Him today. Let's, let's stand together. Um, I will pray. The pastor will be here in, in a moment. When, um, when I finish my prayer, if you just remain standing with your heads bowed in a prayerful attitude, and we'll just have a hymn of your choosing. I don't have one in particular. Uh, maybe um, Just As I Am. Or actually, anything. I should have had a song. But just as she plays this hymn, if God has spoken to your heart, just do business with God this morning and ask Him to help you do what you need to do. Second of all, if you don't know how to implement what you need to do, then before you leave today, just say, Pastor, God's spoken to my heart about having a, an informed conscience. How can I do that? We've, we've said, but I mean, specifically, what are... One, two, three, four, five. Tonight, what can I start doing? Is I have it. Or, you know, I, I just, there's, I have a neighbor, I just don't like him, and I, I, I need to love them. And by the way, what does that mean? How, how can I, what do you do in such a situation? Well, there are answers we haven't talked about today. We were talked about in Sunday school, uh, but that's why you have a pastor. Maybe you're here and you're just saying, you know, um, I don't have respect for authorities in my life. And pastor, I've got a hard boss. What does it mean to do right by a hard boss? I mean, do I actually need to listen to them? What do I do? Well, there you go. See, ask. Be curious. The Bible is practical. It's holy. It's, it, it, it's, it's infallible. It's true. But it's practical. So you, you pray after I finish my prayer. And then if you have a question, just come say, Pastor, I got spoken to my heart. Can I talk to you after the service today? 
He'll know what you mean. You can set something up. Okay? Father, thank you for the word of God. Thank you for this. Uh, thank you for this church, and thank you for our friends here, and thank you for the privilege of being part of your day. Please uh, help us to do the right thing and help us to know why. And I pray that you work in our hearts just now in Jesus' name. Heads are bowed. No one's looking right now as the piano plays. If God's spoken, do business with the Lord right now, would you? You know, we do live in an age where good is called evil, evil is called good. We don't always know how to respond to authority, but we live in an age where God is just the same as He's always been. Yeah. Authority is always what it is. Do you know there's a movement in Christianity, there's a movement in Baptist churches to reject God-given authority. And so today we've seen three, three reasons why we respond to authority. You know one of the reasons why I want to respond right to authority? I want to have a good life. I just want to have a good life. I don't have to be afraid of an evil authority. Uh, I have to be afraid of God and the consequences for not having the right attitude about authority. And, and anyone externally can do anything they wish. And if I am right, according to Romans 13, I'll have a good life. It's great to not be afraid of evil. Not be afraid of, the, of evil. And to even have praise of, the, of God. And to, conscience is something I can't have joy unless it's right about so thank God. Thank God for the message today. Thank you, Brother Will. Dr. Bill Rice will be preaching again this evening, so it's not over. And if you have questions today, maybe it, maybe it's something in particular came up as the Word of God is preaching, as oftentimes it does. When you have a practical, specific question, uh, there are answers, and they're not difficult to find. Uh, Dr. Will, Dr. Bill would love to open a Bible with you. We never close the invitation in our service. Time to respond to the preaching of the Word of God or to get help. It's never over. And so if you have a question, a practical question uh, about the message or about anything, really, uh, they'd love to meet you and they'd love to have the opportunity to be God's minister in your life today. Thank you so much for being here. I hope you'll be back this evening at 6 p.m. hope you have a great afternoon. Uh, God bless you. Let's dismiss with a word of prayer, shall we? It's been so good, God, to be in a place where the thing we have in common is that we're family family because we're part of your family which is amazing it's an incredible thing to be heirs together with jesus christ to be children of god or we're not worthy of that that's what you've made us and so it's just a thrill i ask that you would be with each individual here today you'd meet the spiritual physical needs of each person this afternoon and that you bring us back again this evening to be in fellowship and that you just use the ministry and the ministers that you've sent us here today in order to equip us to serve you. Thank you so much. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Dismissed. Amen.